Well, let's get started. Belief in the judgment, that is, the judgment, reward, and punishment of the soul, arose first among whom? Yeah, those who answered uh, one or two are just factually wrong. You will have read in Plato that it was there already in 400 BC, and, and it was there long, long before that. Belief in eternal judgment pushes people to do good, urges them to do good, so that they will obtain a reward, rather than pushing them to do good just because it's good. But I want us to look particularly at Plato's Socrates and how he deals with judgment of the soul. Is it original with him? In fact, it isn't. Clear evidence of this or detailed evidence of it is in the Odyssey, written evidence. Is it a point of doctrine with him? That is, does Socrates believe that Minos Radamanthus and whatever his name is will judge naked souls and deliver bad ones to punishment? Is this notion of judgment after death a core feature of the way Socrates thinks? I mean, there are certain things that are sort of the core of how you think, right? And anybody who knows you knows you think that because if they have a conversation with you for more than 15 minutes, that is likely to come up. So think back to when Socrates talked to Euthyphro. Did Socrates say to Euthyphro, and you've got to be careful because if you prosecute your dad, you may have to answer to Minos and Rhadamanthos and Iacos. I don't think so. And he, this is more in the Apology, you too must be of good hope as regards death, gentlemen, and keep this one truth in mind. A good man cannot be harmed either in life or in death, and his affairs are not a matter of unconcern to the gods. What's the chief characteristic of the gods in Socrates' thinking? They're good, right? And so a good person is somehow sharing the same quality that the gods have, right? To the degree that a person is good, a person is kin to the gods, and the gods aren't going to make anything bad happen to, to someone who is like them. So what about reward and punishment in this life? Socrates says, are you urging me to strive valiantly with the Athenians to make them as good as possible? Or are, do you urge me to provide service that will make them feel good? Doctor or the pastry chef thing, right? And Callicles says, I'm urging you to make them feel good. You think I should flatter them, pimp for them? Yes. Callicles is persistently saying, you've got to be afraid. You're crazy if you are not afraid of death. And you need to shape your life to protect your life so you don't die. All kinds of judgments function as a kind of threat. Just plain old law court judge, judges, or even the fear of law court judges, the popular girls in eighth grade, right? Those judges can ruin your life if you say the wrong thing or think the wrong thing. You're the one who decides which judge you'll be afraid of. So Socrates specifies in his discussion with Callicles his greatest fear. If I came to my end, if I die, because of a deficiency of pandering oratory, I'd bear my death with ease. For one who isn't, to uh, no one is what it must say, one who isn't totally bereft of reason and courage is afraid to die. Doing what's unjust is what he's afraid of. The person who has some reason and some courage isn't afraid to die, but to do wrong, to become somebody who does terrible things, that's something to be afraid of. It's not the worst thing it is because you end up at the gates of Hades, that is, you're dead and they catch you with it. It's any time you are, your soul is corrupt, that is, your character, who you are, is corrupt, but you become bad. So, it isn't a normal feature of Socrates' discussion to throw in this getting to, to Hades, finding yourself at the gates of Hades um, with, uh, with, these, with this bad soul, but just bad soul in general. It's not seeming to be good, but being good 
that a man should take care of more than anything. Let someone despise you as a fool and throw dirt on you. Let him hit you as if you were a nobody. Nothing terrible will happen to you if you really are an admirable and a good man. Because that goodness is something that's kind of in a different dimension than this one. There's nothing of value in spending your life sucking up to other people so that they'll pat you on the head, give you a good salary and a fancy car and say, oh, he's so important. Um, at the end, you've got nothing. The point of at, this talking about after death or eternal, when we think of eternity, never ending, it goes on and on and on, but I don't think that Plato thinks of it quite that way. You know, That is to say, if we could imagine a, um, we could, let, let's imagine a hunk of iron or something, some kind of metal that would never decay. And it would just last for billions and billions and billions of years and never lose a molecule. It's endless in time, right? But I don't think it's the sort of thing that Plato would call eternal. It isn't inherently forever and in, in the sort of thing that shapes other things and makes goodness in the world. Plato thinks of the world as, you know, th there are things that are transient and unstable and untrue, like this, which is here now and a few years from now will be in a landfill someplace, and uh, like this, very similarly. But there are other things that, that are true and real and unchanging like right angles, 90 degrees. You know the Pythagorean theorem, right? It's there and always true, and it's not the sort of, it isn't like our lump of iron that just never breaks apart exactly. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't eternal just in the sense that its atoms never break apart. It's eternal in the sense that it's somehow inherent to the very nature of the universe, and you can't imagine the universe without it. So. Socrates judges himself against the eternal in the same way that a geometer or an architect or a, or a good carpenter judges himself against the ideal right angle. Eternal judgment, the way Plato thinks, the way Socrates thinks, happens every day. You measure yourself against what just is true. And societies should measure themselves against what's really good instead of just, you know, oh, hey, don't you think we're better than the uh, Nazis, for example? Whereas Callicles has never cared about what ought to be, so, so he's adapted himself completely to what is, and if he suddenly found himself in a world of what ought to be, he'd be miserable. It's like this whole idea of like, um, justice and injustice, that it's better to suffer injustice than commit injustice. And I think he figured in the whole, knowing he was going to be put to death, that if he just shut his mouth and just shut himself away, that he would be doing injustice and therefore would rather suffer the injustice himself. I think you're right that Socrates would say, even if I don't affect any sort of social transformation, it's still important for me to do what is right because it's right. But don't you think he would believe it's better still if I can get the Athenians to care about justice? Well, if it only influences one other person to change that person's life, it, it's foolishness. It's, it's no good. But if you, you know, change uh, a mass of people's lives, well, how many? You know, uh, if you change two people's lives, is then does that make it worthwhile? Or maybe ten? I mean, this sort of almost begs a question, a quantitative question here. It's a judgment of about idealism, which seems strange. To change someone to the Socratic view would, in the, if you only change that one person, then that uh, then you just put the, all the persecution that you have onto that other person as well, because they believe as you do, and there's still this many people who are against you. So, so Jesus only had twelve disciples. But he made a real mistake because he just he, he just basically. Uh, you know, made those people subject to persecution. Like he had the 12 disciples, he said go make disciples of all nations, so they made other disciples and that just, supply, yeah, yeah, it just grows. So right. I don't know if that was Plato's idea too, but perhaps. You said that a gut feeling isn't necessarily a good argument for anything, but in a sense, in a lot of ways, 
religion or religious thoughts or non-religious thoughts are groups of people who have the same gut feeling. So whether it's a good argument or a bad argument, it's certainly a utilized argument. It's this idea of taking that little gut feeling and then universalizing it and saying, well, this is that basic level of good that I want to get everybody to agree to. And they're going to say, what do you base that on again? And I'm like, <laughs> gut feeling. <laughs> like, okay. Dismissing something because it is a gut feeling isn't something I can put myself behind either. I, I need it to be somewhere in between saying I have a gut feeling so I'm looking for more to, to, 